There's been quite a bit of people that have been named Louis that have ruled over France. In fact, if you add up all 17 of their reigns together, it comes to the number of exactly 420. <clears throat> well then, how about we start the ranking with a disqualification. So, King Louis the 17th was never king because he was a prince when his dad was executed during the French Revolution. He lived pretty much his whole life in a prison. He was locked in a room for six months alone until eventually he died of tuberculosis about a year later. Not a king, but he certainly should have been after the death of his father. Let's actually start the ranking with number 17. Louis V, otherwise known as Louis the do not The name really seals the deal for this guy being one of the most boring kings in history. He did nothing. He never had kids, although he was married at one point to a 40 year old when he was only 15. His reign was weak and the nobility and clergy pretty much had complete control over him. His cougar wife eventually divorced him and left him for his rival, William of Provence, making this her fourth marriage. Adelaide of Anjou was quite the player in her day. Probably the most exciting part about his reign was probably his death. Louis happened to be the last member of the Carolingian dynasty that had ruled France for the last 219 years. And when he failed to have kids, this dynasty ended. King Louis V, in my professional opinion, you suck. Coming in at number 16 is King Louis VII. He was the son of King Louis VI, who had managed to set up a marriage between his son and the most illustrious bachelorette in Europe, Eleanor of Aquitaine. This was a really important marriage, seeing as Eleanor of Aquitaine controlled large portions of southern France. An important marriage that Louis would eventually screw up. King Louis was raised for a large portion of his life to be a priest, monk, or bishop. It was only after his brother's death in 1131 that he would start his kingly training. He was not well prepared for the role of king, and he was even less prepared for the role as a husband. That's right, just like Louis V, his wife left him for his rival. This time, his rival was Henry II, taking his vast and wealthy estate of Aquitaine out from under Louis and giving it to the Kingdom of England. Eleanor once said that she thought that she had married a king, and not a monk. This, coupled with their failure to produce a male heir, led to Eleanor leaving Louis. Louis would constantly try to get back at Eleanor, and he even raided far into Aquitaine after their divorce was ratified. He even tried to weaken Eleanor and Henry by supporting the rebellions of their children. Okay, now he's sounding kind of creepy. He was successful in managing to recover Champagne from his enemies, but in the process, he burned a church that was full of 1,500 people seeking asylum. He even failed in the Department of Crusading. He was part of the Second Crusade and was defeated at the Battle of Al Mansur. He only escaped being captured by climbing a nearby cliff, all the while being targeted by arrow fire. Then he did the very noble thing and left his army to be decimated in the Holy Land while he returned to his home in France. He married three times and finally had a boy at the age of 45 after having four girls in a row. He also gave Normandy to his soon to be rival Joffrey Plantagenet. It's said that Louis lived simply, which is great, but it probably would have been a lot better for France and the world if he would have just stayed a monk. Next up on the list is Louis IV. Louis IV was such a puppet that he was often referred to as the Duke's King. That is in relation to his supposed vassal, Duke Hugh of Aquitaine, who was the de facto ruler of France since the time of Louis's father. His father died while imprisoned by Hugh and soon, the young prince would be invited to return to France from his exile in his mother's country of Wessex. The 15-year-old boy was more Anglo-Saxon than French, seeing as he only spoke Old English. He virtually had no power, and after one failed attempt to assert himself by trying to conquer Lotharingia, he was absolutely bitch-slapped and imprisoned by Duke Hugh. He would continue to rule France through the king, even when the Pope excommunicated Hugh, Louis was still too afraid of Hugh to revolt against him. This Louis really never had control over his own destiny, and he really wasn't even French. Next up is Louis II, otherwise known as Louis the Stammerer. Louis II was an elected king, and the reasons for the election became very obvious. The Duke selected him to control him, and they did that very well. Louis was described as being a good person, a lover of peace, justice, and religion, he was crowned by the Pope, but was the first Carolingian king to reject the title of Holy Roman Emperor. He did have something of a backbone when referring to the Pope, seeing as the title of Emperor was actually meant to keep him under the control of the 
The physically weak king only went to war once, against the Vikings that were raiding his northern territories. Unfortunately, he died while on campaign, having done little to nothing besides giving the Pope a solid middle finger. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention the st 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 stutter. Coming in at number 13 is Louis the 15th. This guy probably had more to do with the French Revolution happening than the man who got his head cut off because of it. During his reign, he repeatedly showed signs of weakness, switching back and forth from absolute rule to rule by minister and council multiple times. He would repeatedly oppose his parliaments and overall alienated the people against him far more than most kings would. After an assassination attempt in 1757, Lou was stabbed and could be seen afterwards saying, yes, this healed quickly, but this, pointing towards his head, will never. This shows that even the king's mental health was weak by this time. Further weakened when he lost the Seven Years' War, most of Canada, most of his navy, the War of Polish Succession, and over 200,000 soldiers over all of these conflicts. He did promote trade, and he did try to tax the clergy and nobles equally percentage-wise with the common people. This did not go well, though, and his economy only ran a surplus for one year in 1730. If you want to point fingers for the causes of the French Revolution, then four out of five of those fingers can be pointed in the direction of Louis XV. Next up on the list of Louis is Louis III, also known as Louis the Young. Louis the Young wasn't even past his teenage years when he died. He only reigned for about two years, but he's responsible for Duke Bozzo declaring himself independent from Louis's realm. Both him and his brother tried to defeat Duke Bozzo, but both failed. He was also defeated by Vikings in 880, but defeated them back a year later with help from his brother, who would soon succeed him. This succession would come in 882, when Louis was strolling around the streets of a city called St. Denis. On a power trip, and with help from his raging hormones, he started chasing a local girl that had caught his eye. He chased after her at full speed until the girl ducked into a doorway to hide from the rapist king. Then as he ran through the door, he smacked his fucking head off the doorway, probably doing a dope-ass backflip and fractured his skull, killing him instantly. God, teenagers these days. Next up is the guy who had to deal with a little thing called the French Revolution. That's right, at number 11, we have Louis the 16th. Louis was handed a really bad hand, but instead of doing something about it, he almost fooled it immediately. He gained America, her independence from the British, which I thank him for thoroughly. But in the process of doing this, he put France into a mountain of debt that was impossible to climb out of. Also, by supporting a democratic republic's independence, he made the case of the French revolutionaries all the more justified. Louis was in line with Enlightenment thought though, he wanted to abolish serfdom, and he was even tolerant to non-Catholic religions. He also adopted six kids, who would have had a poor, miserable life otherwise. But he did not have a strong hand over his nobles, who made this clear when in 1789 he called the Estates General. By this point, the Estates haven't been called for nearly 300 years, but Louis needed help to fix his economy that he ran into the dirt. After an oath and a quick game of tennis, the third estate openly revolted against the king. And what do you think Louis did? Well, he sat back and did nothing. He was sure that these peasants would get bored and go home after a while, but he was dead wrong. He could have been more strict and could have prevented the French Revolution or even attempted to, but he did not. His death warrant was signed in 1791 when he and his family attempted to escape from the French revolutionaries and were caught by the French border. In the following year, he was deposed as king and one year after that, in 1793, he lost his head under the blade of a guillotine. The only Louis to ever be executed openly. Next up on the list is Louis XII, coming in at number 10. Louis XII is a great warrior and a great general. He made that clear through his favorite pastime of conquering the shit out of Italy. Even before he was king, Louis could be found in the wealthy state of Milan, capturing cities like Fornovo in the Italian War. Wars that would need to take a brief pause when his cousin died, and he was forced to go back home in order to be crowned king. After taking his cousin's place as king, Louis decided to go straight back to what he loved the most, conquering Italy, which he did quite successfully for a few years, conquering the majority of the peninsula. Well, that is until he made everybody angry. And I mean everybody. All he wanted to do in Italy was fight. He made one ally, the tiny city-state of Genoa. Even Machiavelli criticized Louis's aggressive nature. 
basically telling him that if he doesn't make any friends, they will all team up on him. Well, it turns out that Machiavelli was right. And in 1504, Spain headed a coalition and took Naples out from under him. He never had a short supply in soldiers in Italy because he strategically made an alliance with the Swiss Confederacy, which basically stated that Louis could recruit as many as the Swiss mercenaries as he wanted. This was great for him, and it supplied him with some of the best soldiers that money could buy at the time. That is, until he made them so mad that they also turned on him and helped the coalition, headed by Venice this time, in recapturing the Duchy of Milan in 1512. You know it's bad when you can manage to piss off the normally neutral Switzerland. By the end of Louis's life, after all the fighting and conquering that he had done, he had exactly what he had started with. He loved fighting so much that he even founded the Order of the Porcupine for knights to join. The Porcupine was in relation to his offensive strategies that he employed that were similar to the offensive needles of the Porcupine. Kind of a silly name, but I guess it fits. He did manage to make a few legal reforms and he lessened the pensions that nobles received. But other than that, the next notable things would be his three marriages. First, he was forced to marry his 40-year-old sterile cousin in an effort for him to not produce any children so his bloodline and his claim to the throne would die out. And then after they needed his bloodline and he became king, he remarried the previous queen and secured Brittany with her death. And when she died, he was then married to Henry VIII's sister for a few months before his death in 1515. Next up on our list is quite possibly the least powerful king of France. Of course, I'm talking about King Louis XVIII, coming in at number nine. Louis, who is often referred to as Louis Philippe, restored the monarchy after, well, he was the only successful constitutional monarch of France and the last king of France to die as a king. He had no real power, but at the same time, he made sure not to overstretch that power that he did have. He ran around the courts of Prussia, Russia, and England, just waiting for one of them to defeat Napoleon so they could put him on the throne. The coalition managed to defeat Napoleon in 1814 and put him back on the throne. Then he lived in comfort for a while, until Napoleon decided to come back to France from his exile in Elba. Upon seeing that Napoleon was returning, Louis said, nope, 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 not dealing with this, and exited his country so that Prussia and England could put Napoleon back into exile. He cut Napoleon's military spending by 55%, but did he really have a choice? Napoleon's war machine was a multi-million dollar yearly affair. During his reign, the French people were given freedoms, like freedom of religion and freedom of speech. But also, he once again had little to do with this. The first French prime minister took power during his reign, but once again, he really didn't have a say in this matter. Louis's most important accomplishment would probably come from his translation works. He worked tirelessly on translating old language texts to new ones, and wrote constantly. He promised not to tax the French people on wine, salt, or bread before his reign. Until he found out that this is the most important part of the French economy. Then he decided against it. Wow, lying politician. Who would have guessed it? Louis was a smart guy though, and I'll give him that much credit. He did have something of a gruesome death. He died of both wet and dry gout and gangrene. Yummy. Okay, now we're on to the half-decent Louis, and coming in at number eight is... Well, Louis VIII. King Louis VIII is part of a super interesting little tidbit of English history called the Barons' War. The angry English barons called this Louis, who was prince at the time, to come across the English Channel to replace their King John as king. He did so and was arguably King of England for a year, with many southern English nobles supporting him. Kind of like the Glorious Revolution, but with a lot more bloodshed and a lot less glory. He almost conquered England, but he had one little thorn in his backside in the southern part of England that he controlled. King John was mediocre, but he didn't realize how important the fortress at the White Cliffs of Dover was, so he made it an impregnable fortress. Louis would try to capture this fort and would fail miserably, his hopes of being the King of England going with that siege. Soon after the siege, King John would die, and his nine-year-old son would succeed him, and the barons thought he'd be a much better candidate to control than Louis was. So, the remaining barons that supported Louis kicked him out of England. Louis fought a few battles with them. He showed courage and earned the title of Louis the Lionheart. He wasn't a bad warrior, but he really wasn't that good. 
I mean, he didn't conquer anything and failed in England after being invited in. He did manage to fix France's debt situation, but he could only do this by refusing to let Jewish landowners record the money that they had given to Louis. Maybe a little anti-Semitic, but he mainly did this just because France was poor. Louis was very efficient in fulfilling his kingly duty of producing children, as he had 13 kids with his wife Blanche of Castile. The only thing he really did during his three-year reign was renew the Algebacinian crusade against the French Protestants, which he did pretty well at crushing. Overall, I think Louis was an okay warrior, but I don't think he deserves the title of a lion-hearted one. Next is the Louis that started it all. Coming in at number seven is King Louis I, otherwise known as Louis the Pious. King Louis was the son of Charlemagne. You know, that guy that practically invented the empire that all of these Louis reigned over. King Louis was one of the few real Holy Roman Emperors and was crowned as such by the Pope. He was appointed co-emperor when Charlemagne grew too old to rule effectively and took his place as emperor the following year. Louis I then set about conquering the tribes that lingered on the borders of his kingdom, which he did quite effectively, spreading the range of the Carolingian Empire even further. After returning from a campaign in Spain, he took the same trail that his father took when he was ambushed by the Basque people and surprise, surprise, they were waiting for him there. But where his father had suffered his only defeat would be where Louis would use diplomacy. And by diplomacy, I mean threat of violence. And by threat of violence, I mean that he had Basque hostages that he would have killed if they had attacked him. Good job, Louis. He also had to deal with sea raiding Vikings in the northern portions of his realm. He then constructed a large North Sea fleet to hunt them down. Louis also had three sons with his first wife, then when she died, his nobles forced him to remarry. And this was probably the worst thing that he could have done. He established his three sons as co-kings and put them in charge of portions of land in the empire that they were set to govern. He even set up succession laws, instructing how all future kings should be appointed. That was great, until he decided to break the laws. When his second wife gave him a boy named Charles, Louis played favorites. Of course, it's always the youngest, but his three other brothers could plainly see the favorite. This became evident when Louis appointed Charles as one of his successors in 830. His other sons then got super jealous of their little brother and rebelled against King Louis. Louis defeated this rebellion pretty quickly and banished his oldest son to Italy. Man, what a punishment that is. I wish someone would banish me to Italy. Two years later, in 832, he militarized in his son's kingdom of Aquitaine after discovering that that son was about to revolt against him again. This had the consequences of making his other two sons mad at him again, which they both openly revolted against him. This time though, the sons brought Big Daddy Pope with them so he could fight their dad. After settling on a battlefield, the Pope rap battled Louis and he roasted him so bad that his soldiers defected to him. Louis would call this battle the Battle of the Field of Lies and it was won by Louis' sons with no blood spilled on either side. Soon after this, they would imprison their dad and force him to seek penance, only returning to his throne after about a year. But Charles would once again be shown as the favorite when Louis gave him the Kingdom of Aquitaine as a hand-me-down when his son died in 837, who used to rule the Kingdom of Aquitaine. The two remaining brothers rejected this, and one of them went into open rebellion, but was soundly defeated. He had his land stripped only to Bavaria, as Charles made faces at him from the shores of Aquitaine. He pardoned this child on his deathbed and restored his land, however. Louis wasn't even that pious. He was only called this for seeking penance after ordering the execution of his nephew. The first Louis was powerful, but only when he could get his sons to all agree on something. Next up, at number six, is King Louis X, also known as Louis the Emancipator. This Louis is most famous for banning slavery and setting up a system so that the peasants could buy their way out of serfdom. He did this in 1315, might I remind you, almost 400 years before France would actually ban slavery. He was far ahead of his time and was even tolerant towards the Jewish. Well, he kind of was. He let the Jewish people return from their exile, but on one condition. They had to live in separate marked parts of town and were forced to wear armbands that signified that they were Jewish. Sound familiar? Yeah, Louis might be responsible for alienating the Jewish community and creating some of the first Jewish ghettos, but he did let them back in. His first wife 
and all of his sister-in-laws were imprisoned by Louis's father, the current king of France, who believed them all to be cheating on his sons. One was saved, one was banished, and one was strangled. Louis's wife would be the one that was strangled, and after becoming king, he would remarry Clementine of Hungary in 1315. Louis did little else in his two-year reign in France, but he did order the construction of the first ever indoor tennis court and is the first ever tennis player in recorded history. Surely tennis courts won't have adverse effects on the French kings. Surely. Coming in as the fifth best Louis is Louis the Sixth, also known as Louis the Fat. Louis was so fat that by the time he was 40, he couldn't ride a horse without breaking its back. But before this, he could most commonly be found on a horse, wielding a drumstick, I mean sword, against his enemies. He was a great general and a good warrior, and defeated many of the robber barons in his country who would extract money from people for crossing through their territory. These barons would get out of control, and Louis did a wonderful job at crushing them and centralizing the French kingdom on him. He managed to defeat the King of England, William Rufus, in 1098. When William's brother took his place, Henry I met with Louis to discuss the vassalage of Henry. See, the problem was, was that Henry was the King of England, but he was also Louis's vassal as the Duke of Normandy. As you can imagine, having a vassal more powerful or equally as powerful as you is a problem. And when their discussion turned into argument, things went sour. Louis did the unthinkable and challenged Henry to an eat -off. I mean, he, he challenged him to single combat. Henry wanted to avoid being eaten by Louis, so he rejected the offer and readied himself for war against Louis. Louis would end up losing this war and he would be forced to recognize the King of England as a legitimate kingdom. But in the process, he did eliminate the rest of those pesky robber barons who rose up to side with Henry. He centralized France and even regulated trade in 1121 so he could get more gravy for his biscuits. He also scared away the Holy Roman Emperor from attacking just by standing at his border with an army. Quite the formidable foe. But the most important thing that he did was on his deathbed. He was able to arrange a marriage between his son, Louis VII, and Eleanor of Aquitaine, the most powerful woman in Europe, a great fighter, and an even greater backbreaker of horses. Coming in at number four on this list is the best Louis in the eyes of the church, and that is Louis IX, who is, quite literally, Saint Louis. Louis was a humanist way before he was cool to be a humanist. He was considered among his contemporaries to be the first among equals and saw over a golden age in French history. Louis would bathe the feet of a hundred homeless people daily and personally serve them food. He created many hospitals and even proposed the idea of innocent until proven guilty. He was canonized as a saint after his death in the year 1297. Louis was a great guy, a really, really great guy, if you were a Catholic, that is. However, if you were Jewish or Protestant, the same cannot be said. He banned Jewish money lending in 1230, and by 1243, he cleared his own debt by burning around 12,000 Jewish account books and their own holy books. He also supported the French Inquisition to combat anyone in his country that was not Roman Catholic. He supposedly owned the crown of thorns that somehow hadn't disintegrated after a period of some 1,300 years. This saint's biggest flaw came in his holy mission. The crusades that he participated in were just disastrous. Louis first went on the Seventh Crusade, where he was soundly defeated by the Ayyubid Sultanate and imprisoned. They only released the king after his ransom was paid, a ransom of around two million US dollars. Then he participated in the Eighth Crusade. He landed in Tunis, hoping to carve out a piece of Africa close to France so that he could rule. And a few weeks into the crusade, his life was cut short by dysentery. Saint Louis is the namesake of the American city that bears his name, and the only king of France to be a saint. Oh man, I think I'm going to get a lot of hate for this one, but here we go. Coming in at number three on my list of the best Louis is King Louis XIV, known as the Sun King. This guy is the longest reigning monarch in world history, coming in at a staggering 72 years of reign. He was probably the most absolute ruler of his time, or maybe ever, and he used the Palace of Versailles to keep his nobles close and in line. 
I mean, he literally had nobles lining outside of his bathroom to wipe his ass. The reason that he is number three and not higher up on this list comes from his feelings about war. Out of the 72 years that he reigned, Louis was at war for 52 of those years. He succeeded in almost all of them, but who would a draw in the last one? He faced a total of three coalitions, which made up most of Western Europe. The first two he defeated with relative ease and added much territory to France. The last war would see him give up almost all the territory that he gained in order for him to put his grandson on the throne of Spain. You could see this as a win if you exclude the fact that this alliance of cousins didn't even last a decade after Louis' death. He was also forced to give large portions of Canada and North America to the British. Louis had no need for anyone other than himself and might be one of the biggest narcissists in history. He attempted to humanize slavery with his Noir Code, which even sounds terrible to say. Another code he created was the Code of Laws called the Code Louis and is the precursor to the Napoleonic Code. He really was the Napoleon of his time. The thing that excludes him from being placed higher is the two million French that died in a famine that lasted from 1693 to 1710. This was largely his fault and was caused by Louis' endless wars. Louis was so old that when he died, his great-grandson was the next in line of succession. Louis XIII was a weak king at the start of his reign, and he could not overcome his mother, who acted as his regent, but she overstayed her welcome. It's during his reign that the kingdoms of Navarra and France would merge. For a long time, these kingdoms were separate, but ruled usually by the same person. He would eventually exile his mother so that he could finally take his place as the absolute king. The hardest thing for someone in power to do is to give away that power. But that's exactly what Louis did, and it would pay dividends for him. Louis had a huge council that he met with frequently. He even invited his mother back to give him counsel. His two most important advisors, though, were two cardinals, one named Cardinal Mazarin and the other named Cardinal Richelieu, who both tirelessly worked to help France. Louis would ban violence and things that caused them, like guns and private armies, furthering his control over the citizens. Louis was also a talented lute and guitar player. He was said to have a double row of teeth, though, but compensated for this by being a fashionista. You know those white wigs that the English Parliament and Founding Fathers would wear? That was Louis who started that, as well as uh, fashion trends and elaborate royal clothing. He would also build a small hunting lodge at the place of the future palace of Versailles. Louis listened to his council so well that one of the only times he didn't listen to them was when he was most right. In 1636, a Spanish army was marching towards Paris, and Louis was told to leave and evacuate his capital city. But he did not listen to his advice, and he marched out to meet the Spanish army where he soundly defeated them. Overall, his reign was largely peaceful and well-directed, thanks to his counselors. Now, can I get a drum roll, please? The best Louis of all time is King Louis XI, known as the Universal Spider. And no, he wasn't Spider-Man. Besides having a badass nickname, Louis XI was quite possibly the smartest of all the French kings. This guy was real politicking before he was cool. He was called the Universal Spider because he would spin plots of lies and contempt that would force his enemies to fight one another while he sat back and watched. He is largely responsible for the English Wars of the Roses, even supplying the Kingmaker, the Earl of Warwick, to stir the pot in England. He would end the Hundred Years' War, which was actually the Hundred Sixteen Years' War, with diplomacy. Louis also promoted a meritocracy and only employed the most capable of men to fill his court. He helped fix the French tax system, and in the process, he helped to weaken the power of his nobles. Louis also held a magnificent moving court, which would parade its way through France on the new advanced network of roads that he had commissioned. So you never knew exactly where he was. He also created the French Postal Service, which helped centralize the state of France even more. He also supported a capitalist trading society, and promoted many capitalist ideas before the term was even coined. He also helped to end the Pope Wars, which won him respect with the real Pope in Rome. He managed to bring back the rebellious large vassal of Burgundy back under French control. He largely controlled his clergy well, and could even appoint his own bishop, beating out the concept of investiture, where popes were the only ones that could appoint bishops, which was pretty common everywhere else in Europe. He did marry an eight-year-old, 
but solely for political purposes, and thankfully, he did not consummate this marriage until she was of age, narrowly passing the creepy vibe check. He eventually died of a stroke prematurely due to his work ethic. Louis XI is largely overlooked, but I believe that he is the best Louis, and quite possibly, the best king that France ever had. Let me know how you would rank these Louis. Thank you for watching.